What would happen if? That was the eternal question in the Cold War. What if the Red Army's tanks cost the inner German border? From what point would NATO consider a nuclear strike? How would the Warsaw Pact react? Who makes the first move? The plans of the strategists in the East and the West were pure game theory. But only one certain thing could often be concluded from this theory. There would be no winner. Whoever pressed the red button first would in turn perish to nuclear countermeasures. Hundreds of millions of people would have burned up within 20 minutes. In Russia, in the United States, but above all in Central Europe, with Germany as the battlefield in the midst of it all. The story told by the series Deutschland 83 is based on this exact scenario. 20 years after the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, the Cold War is once again on the verge of turning into a real military conflict. Due to several incidents, the mood on both sides of the Iron Curtain is extremely tense. NATO has announced a string of military maneuvers in Western Europe, stirring all the more concern with Communist Moscow and East Berlin. Their assessment of the situation? The United States of America wants to carry out a first nuclear strike against the Soviet Union. This military maneuver, codenamed Able Archer 83, was in fact a simulated nuclear war game staged by NATO that, when carried out in earnest, could have turned the two German states into a nuclear contaminated desert. In fact, it was so realistic at the time that the Soviet Union thought that NATO was preparing for an attack and put its nuclear forces on alert. Bombers stationed in the Eastern German Democratic Republic and Poland were armed with nuclear missiles. Not much was missing, and a misinterpretation could have sparked World War III. Now, this all sounds like an over-the-top plot point of a spy thriller series, but it is in fact very close to how the real Germany looked in 1983. A wonderful era, by the way, about which I made a video, along with the threat of the Third World War that loomed over it and the world, which makes it a perfect series for a spy thriller which first aired in 2015 on the American channel Sundance TV. In fact, making it the first German language series to air in the US. The details in the series are, of course, dramatized. In order to gain more knowledge about this potential outbreak of the Third World War, the Stasi sends the young soldier Martin Rau, played by Jonas Ney, to the West as a spy. His mission? To infiltrate the West German Bundeswehr under a false identity and to scout out information about missile locations and various NATO plans within the army. However, Martin learns that the West is not quite as straightforward as how the East made them look to be. The young GDR spy might not only infiltrate the West, but the West might infiltrate him as well. Hard to say no to those succulent Western burgers after all. A succulent McDonald's. Hey, oh. Gentlemen, this is Democracy Manifest. Having said that, the series is meant to depict the Cold War conflict in various shades of grey according to the series' creators, Anna and Jörg Winger. So they claim they do not want to give a history lesson but rather just tell a good story, Deutschland 83 has a realistic take on the spy genre. And realistic by no means stands for the gritty realism that we have come to know in the past decade. Many other spy thrillers focus on action, brutal interrogations and other escapades that uh, only a Spanish spy with a Scottish accent could pull off. I'm not Spanish, I'm Egyptian. Yeah, that's exactly what a Spanish spy would say. Deutschland 83, however, seeks to hold the tension which is also due to the fact that the story is not told from the perspective of the historical winners, but consistently taken from the perspective of a wanderer between the systems, who soon has his moral and social obligations in both the East and the West. 
The contrast sketched between the East and the West could be called rather typical and even on the nose, with Western pop music and overly pied supermarkets being the first thing to greet our protagonist after he leaves the grey and dreary East behind to wake up in a bright red Puma shirt in the West. But even so, attempts are made to dispense with Eastern cliches as much as possible. It was important for the wingers not to mimic another scornful look at life in the GDR, but to simply let East-West standards be differences. Nevertheless, the viewer cannot avoid being guided with elegant tacking shots through full Western shopping shelves, wood panel GDR administrative rooms or past GDR citizens um, bathing naked. After all, communism is another way to say that uh, sharing is caring. <laughs> At the same time, however, there was also a challenge to avoid a story that portrayed the communist era in a nostalgic romantic way. Ostalgie, as it is called in Germany, a romanticized way of life in the socialist system. So, for better or worse, you will not find any glorification of good old Soviet Russia here, Tavarish. This was incredibly important for Jörg Ringer, because he knew people who had relatives in the GDR who were tortured there. The series examines the upper echelons of the East German government and shows their machinations and Martin's loss of innocence as he continues to sink into his role as a Stasi spy. It all results in a series that, despite some of its inaccuracies, has its heart in the right place and has plenty of room left for subtleties and a post-ideological view of the ideological upheavals in the early 80s. For example, when Martin arrives in the capitalist of the Federal Republic and asks his liaison where the parades are taking place in this small stuffy town of Bonn, his counterpart replies, They aren't into parades here. The true luxury of the West is that no one pays attention to you. They call that freedom. Mmm, the melancholy of a socialist featured on paid American TV. In the West, that's called irony. Oh, you know what else is irony? Not being able to watch German series while living in Germany. In many of my previous videos, I often get asked the question where one can watch a lot of these foreign series. While a lot can usually be found on the online streaming services, many services like Netflix unfortunately have much of their content region locked. An easy solution to this is to use a VPN, a tool that encrypts your data and hides your virtual location by giving you a new IP and DNS address. It just so happens that Atlas VPN is running a huge discount on their 3 year deal for just $1.39 per month with a 30 day money back guarantee. If you're interested in this deal, make sure to check it out by clicking on the link in the video description below. Using Atlas VPN is as easy as opening up the app on your computer or phone and connecting to the country of whichever library you'd like to unlock, reloading the website and logging into your streaming service. Want to watch Babylon Berlin on Netflix in Germany? Just log on to an American server. Want to watch Generation War from the US? Connect to a German server. Want to watch one of India's refined romances? Log on to India and watch Tapki fall in love with a gorilla. Sharing is caring, so regardless of whether you're American, German, a gorilla or otherwise, Atlas VPN can provide you access to whichever country you like. Plus, with Atlas VPN's data breach monitor, you can scan the internet to see whether your email address ended up in any recorded data breaches or data dumps that might have exposed your name, password or other sensitive information to help ensure that none of your data gets stolen if anything did get leaked. Atlas VPN is supported on every device and provides a 30 day money back guarantee, so make sure to check out their big discount in the link below where you can find a 3 year deal for just $1.39 per month. A big thank you to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. Even though the showmakers claim that they're primarily interested in telling a good story, there's certainly a degree of historicity about the events portrayed in Deutschland 83. But having said that, there never was a real Martin Rauch or a single Stasi agent who prevented the outbreak of a nuclear war. 
But there was, in fact, an actual hero in history, namely a Soviet general who saw something on his radar that, at the last moment and after a brief consideration, he identified as harmless. If he'd pressed the other button, a potential third war is exactly what would have happened, however. His name was Stanislav Petrov. On September 26, 1983, Lieutenant Colonel Petrov was the officer on duty at the Soviet Air Defense Forces, the branch responsible for computer and satellite-based surveillance of the Soviet airspace. Shortly after midnight, his computer reported the launch of a nuclear missile from the United States aimed at the Soviet Union. After an enemy missile launch, the Soviet Union has 28 minutes to, irrevocably, decide on a counterattack. Since the rocket launch came from a single base according to the system, Petrov considered a first strike unlikely, however. Additionally, the reliability of the satellite system had previously been questioned several times. Petrov decided to report a false alarm to the military leadership. A short time later, however, the computer system reported a second, third, fourth and fifth launched missile. Since the satellite system ultimately reported no further missiles, Petrov once again decided to assume it was a false alarm, since in his opinion, an actual nuclear strike should have taken place with significantly more missiles. No other data was available to him in order to be able to check his classification in this period. The land-based Soviet radar could not provide any additional data because its range was too short. It was only after 17 minutes that it became clear from the count radar data that no missiles were actually approaching. During this decision-making phase, Petrov was under considerable pressure. On the one hand, forwarding incorrect satellite data with a false warning would have led to a Soviet nuclear first strike. On the other hand, in the event of an actual US attack, Dozens of nuclear warheads would immediately have fallen on Soviet territory and its classification of the satellite warning as a fake would have severely limited the Soviet options for action. In the morning, it was found that the satellite-based Soviet early warning system had misinterpreted solar reflections on clouds as nuclear launches, which was located near the Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana, where US ICBM were actually stationed. Faulty computers and satellite technology alone was not enough to keep Mother Russia safe, however. Espionage in the Cold War was very much an actual thing. It was estimated that there were more than 2,000 undercover Stasi agents actively operating in West Germany at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall. In fact, there may very well be one very real Soviet agent whose actions may have served as a basis for the series. During the student movement of the 1960s, a certain Rainer Rupp was approached by the East German Main Directorate for Reconnaissance, the GDR's Foreign Intelligence Service and the same HVR that we regularly see featured in Deutschland 83. Just like in the series, Rupp infiltrated his way into the NATO headquarters in Brussels as a Stasi spy under the codenames Mosul and Topaz. In an interview, the so-called Topaz traced his exact career path and reported on how he obtained several of NATO's most secret documents over many years. Any information he uncovered was transmitted using a code converter device called a Schnellgeber. This enabled Stasi agents on missions abroad to transmit uncovered information to East Berlin. Hoops' Schnellgeber was hiding in a commercially available and functional pocket calculator. Before transmitting data, the agent had to insert a needle into a tiny, well-hidden hole to change the device's mode of operation. Another commonly used tool by Soviet spies in the Cold War was the art of seduction. In the series, Martin Rauch begins a relationship with a NATO secretary as a so-called Romeo. A Romeo trap is the name of an espionage act in which a male agent establishes a love relationship with a target person, for the purpose of recruitment for example. The Hafo are frequently used this method for the espionage. Preferred target persons were employees in security authorities or German federal ministries. These methods would often have serious and long-lasting consequences for their targets. 
the GDR Secret Service was interested in information from the NATO headquarters in Brussels much earlier than it appears in the television series, however. After all, you didn't want to look for information in the face of an emergency. You would want to know what the other side was planning as early as possible, rather than to wait for the emergency to come to pass. As a precautionary measure, the Stasi would constantly have their eyes on NATO's activities. And not just with Heiner Rupp. Corresponding departments which had specialized in reconnaissance against NATO existed much earlier within the HVA. Instead of reacting to an imminent threat, the GDR and the Soviet Union wanted to be informed well before something would actually have happened. But instead of placing GDR spies in the Federal Republic and other so-called Western countries, the communists actually preferred to look for contacts in the West. These were much easier to camouflage, just like how Rupp was recruited from among left-wing activists in the West. It is in fact Rupp who claims to have convinced his commanding officers in the GDR that the USA was not planning an attack on the Soviet Union when the Soviet army was put on high alert in response to NATO's military exercise codenamed Able Archer 83, the same one as depicted in the series. Just like in the series, he reported to his superiors that Able Archer was in fact a maneuver and not an attack. The Soviet leadership was reportedly hesitant to believe it, but according to Rupp, the GDR leadership assured recipients in the USSR with information from Rupp that no attack was imminent, thereby averting any first strike scenarios. The British and Americans were in turn informed by their own agents that Moscow was in a high state of alert. While the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board came to the conclusion in 1990 that the United States inadvertently almost provoked a war during Able Archer 83 in the fall of 1983 though, no records from the Politburo meetings of the Soviet Union published in 2013 ever managed to confirm whether it was primarily due to Rupp's actions that a misunderstanding of nuclear proportions was prevented. Still, that didn't stop him from writing a book about it and getting caught by the CIA in 1993 and serving a 12-year sentence. Whether the same fate will befall Martin Rauch in Deutschland 83, I leave to you to find out. I can definitely recommend the series if you're interested in the setting or spy thrillers in general, as it has done an excellent job representing both departments. In fact, the series was successful enough to have received a second and a third season in 2018 and 2020 respectively, which too are great to watch. In fact, I might cover those in future videos, as there's plenty more history behind the series moving forward. As of the making of this video, the first season of the series is available on Amazon Prime, so be sure to check it out and to let me know in the comments what you thought about it. And if you like to see more of this kind of content and have me look into more historical foreign series and the history behind them, be sure to like, comment and subscribe to help support the channel and to help seize the means of subscription. Remember, it's not communism, it's a... Uh, Surprise equality.